Welcome to Killer Women with your host, best-selling author, Danielle Girard. And now, Danielle's next killer woman. Welcome to Killer Women Podcast, a proud member of the Authors on the Air Global Network with more than 4 million listeners. I'm your host, suspense author Danielle Girard, and my guest today is Lisa Jewell. Lisa is the number one New York Times bestselling author of 19 novels, including The Family Upstairs and Then She Was Gone, as well as Invisible Girl and Watching You. Her novels have sold over 10 million copies internationally, and her work has also been translated into 29 languages. You can connect with Lisa at Twitter at Lisa Jewel UK, on Instagram at Lisa Jewel UK, and on Facebook at Lisa Jewel Official. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you. Lovely to see you. Lovely to see you. We were just talking about Lisa's, she, her camera. She's She's got a noir, sort of old film noir look to her. So we're just going to go with yeah. that. Um, I'd like to be crisp, but I can't be crisp for technical. <laughs> you're 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 awfully crisp in lots of ways. So we won't worry about this. <laughs> we won't worry about this one little strange anomaly you're having. So please, first of all, let, let's see the cover of this book, because I got this fun edition where the cover had not yet been revealed. But the actual cover of the book is gorgeous. Ta-da! I love it. I absolutely love and this it. This is actually, oh, yeah, no, this is a, an advanced one. It will be a, it'll be a hardback. Yes, in the of shop. course. It's but this so is the artwork. This is a stunning artwork and it is it's... just so unsettling and beautiful. And yeah, <laughs> it is stunning and unsettling. And okay, so bef- I have a million questions for you, Lisa. But before I start, please tell our listeners about None of This Is True. Of course, absolutely. So None of This Is True. Um, it's a story of two women who have a chance meeting when they're out in the same pub um, on the same night, both celebrating their 45th birthdays. Um, and they have a, they come together in the in the ladies' bathroom and realise that not only are they sharing a birthday, but they're actually birthday twins. They were born on the same year in the, and, and in the same hospital. Um, but they're incredibly different women. One of them, Alex, is very glamorous. She's in the pub celebrating her birthday with a huge group of friends. Um, Josie, the other woman, the other birthday twin, is having a quieter night with her much older husband, Walter. And she's kind of slightly tantalised, um, mesmerised by by Alex and her, her glamorous appeal and the fact that they're birthday twins. Um, she Googles Alex when she gets home and discovers that Alex is actually a reasonably famous podcaster and then proceeds to spend a whole week obsessively listening to all of Alex's podcasts, which are all on the themes of successful women who've overcome the odds to become successful. And she finds what she engineers a meeting with Alex on the street to give her a proposition. I think you should make your next podcast about me. I've had a very challenging life, but I haven't yet made a success in my life and I'm about to. And you might want to record the process of my life changing. Um, Alex is initially slightly put off by uh, Josie's demeanour. She's a little bit strange, um, slightly creepy, slightly on the creepy side of things, but can't resist the um, the sound of her story. So agrees to start recording a podcast with her. And that's when everything gets very, very dark. Very, very quickly. <laughs> which is very much the uh, Lisa Jewell reality right everything yes. gets everything looks normal for just a few minutes and then everything yes. gets dark very very quickly so exactly in the, in the acknowledgments you mentioned that you had a conversation with your sister and that you sort of had this image of a man through a window working on a laptop which is a is a pretty benign image right I mean there's it, not, is. Like, it doesn't scream it doesn't scream what happens in this book to me. So tell no. us, I, I mean, is this how your books sort of, is that the seed of them? Something so sort of yeah. normal? It's just something that, it's just something that for whatever reason, and it's n- nearly always a person, but it can be a place or a house, um, but it's nearly always a person, just seems a degree off. Uh, so everybody else, so I can see a person in a crowd and everybody else just looks like, you know, just flesh wandering around. And every now and then a person just pops out and there's just something about them that's a degree off. And that's kind of what I want to pursue. I want to work out what their story is, what it's like to be them. I want to get inside their head 
and find out how they would behave in certain situations or what secrets they're hiding. And in the case of this guy I saw in the window, just innocently looking at his laptop, I just was convinced that there was something really weird going on in his apartment behind the scenes. And I kept getting this recurring image of a, of a door closed at the end of a corridor and somebody behind that door. And I didn't know who it was. I didn't know if they were in danger uh, or if they were the threat. And yeah, then then for a writer like me who doesn't have like big ideas or big plans, you just have to sit down and start typing and work it all out on the page. <laughs> I love that. Okay. So you start with, so you're basically, when you started that, that book, you, you thought, cause you discovered of course, behind the, the door is a, a daughter who is a gamer and she is, is living there. but the book really features the women. So once you sort of start to discuss out this man, it was his wife who sort of rose to the, to the forefront yeah, of the story. And, and actually that happens to me quite often. Um, I, I quite often start think, think I'm going to set the story from a certain person's point of view. But actually, once I start writing the story, there's some there's usually someone standing on the sidelines who just captures my my imagination. And that was the case with this. He was going to be my weird stalker. Walter was going to be. And that's not to say that Walter isn't a little strange, because I think we yeah. can all agree that Walter is incredibly strange. In fact, they're a very strange couple, Walter and Josie. They're just one of those, you know, those couples yes. where you just wouldn't invite them round for dinner um, unless you happen to be making a podcast about one of them. Right. Um, and yeah, and I just kind of thought that Josie was a more interesting proposition. Um, so she was the one who ended up being my main, my main point of view. And you love, I mean, in all the stories I've read of yours, you really love to take, you know, these families, these, these, in, these relationships and really sort of pull them apart. I mean, I think about the family upstairs and, and, and so many of, of your, books really feature these these characters so tell us how you it sounds like you're not a plotter you're not somebody who sort of has it <laughs> has an outline so what is that like are you free writing about the you know how, how does this develop yes yeah, free that's a really good way of describing it, actually free writing no that's exactly what it feels like I really really even day to day I don't have a plan even in the moment of opening my laptop and bringing my document up on the screen and and positioning my fingers above the keyboard I still don't have a plan I just think I've got to get some words down um I've got to write something so let's just write something and see where it leads me um and yeah so usually what I will do just to just to get the engines running is reread and I think most writers do this I'm sure you do reread the chapter that you wrote the day before or reread whatever it was you wrote the day before just to get your, yourself back in the game a little. and then it's just time to start writing something else and and honestly, in the case of sometimes that can be like really, really hard work when you don't really know where the story is going. Right. Um, and I find it much harder in when I'm writing more functional characters. Um, and when I say functional, I mean that in both ways. I mean, they have a function in the in the book, um, but they're also functional in, in as much as they're they're. Um, they're, they're reasonably normal people um but when you come to a character like Josie or like Henry Lamb in my family books yeah or like right. Owen Pick in Invisible Girl or right. Noel Donnelly and then she was gone uh, those are the ones where when you come to your your laptop every day and you don't know what you're doing and you don't know where you're headed and they're the ones who really really do lead the way the, the the weird ones are the ones who, who sort of inform the journey and <laughs> whereas with the more functional characters you're having to guide them a lot more so really I was gonna say because it feels very much like reading your books it feels like those sort of abnormal characters or we'll call them or you know the, the characters that are a bit off or sometimes really really off and um, they, <laughs> they they really do some come I mean all the characters come to life but those in particular you seem to have such a you know really innate ability to make those people feel so real even though they are so I mean they're, they're not people we normally would run into in life so it feels like they are the momentum of the story so you do you feel like those characters are easier to write or harder to write yeah no they they do the writing for me and that's, mm -hmm. that might sound slightly pretentious I don't know but it feels like that they write themselves for me they're just they're just ready to go and jump off the page and do all the weird things there's a moment at the very so in this weird dynamic that builds up between Alex and Josie, the reader, because we're switching viewpoints between Alex and Josie, so we're seeing Josie's private life 
whereas Alex only is only seeing what Josie tells her during their podcast interviews. So the reader is much more of, of a witness or has much more of a sense of, of how dangerous Josie could potentially be mm -hmm. or how dishonest or untrustworthy she is. Um, and there's a moment, and I, I wasn't quite sure how this was all going to work out, and there was just this absolutely pivotal, informing moment for me when I was developing the character of Josie when she's just finished her first episode of the podcast in Alex's recording studio and Alex is she's very well to do she has a very generous husband who provides very well for her and he actually built her this recording studio in their back garden for her 40th birthday present which is very nice of him um and she has a little Nespresso machine in there for her guests and a jar of um pods coffee pods and for I just I wasn't expecting Josie to do this uh, the reader would not be expecting Josie to do this and neither was I she puts her hand in the jar takes a coffee pod puts it in her pocket and then the next scene is her going home taking it out of her pocket and putting it in her underwear drawer and it's just right right and I wasn't quite sure what she just done or why she'd done it or what it meant but it was an absolutely it's just the minute she did that I thought right okay let's go <laughs> that's right and it is so telling and then of course over time she get you know that that is a behavior that escalates she's you know it, it's so identifies her as somebody who really covets Alex's life. And that's a way of obtaining a little tiny piece of what Al what she, you know, this yes. perfection that it, Al Alex has. Yes, which obviously escalates. Yes. It's a small starting point for a situation that escalates. Um, yeah. Quickly. Yes, right. <laughs> Qu quickly and, and very dramatically. Absolutely. So I, I you know, I, I always read the acknowledgements because I always think that such a, there's yeah. always so many fun gems in there from, from, you know, and I, and I, I often sometimes read them first and then occasionally I, I, I did that with Jillian McAllister's last book and I don't recommend it because it does do a bit of a um I've read it. Yeah, yes. a bit of a giveaway. And so Which not always, thing. <laughs> yeah, not always is that a good idea. But in years I noticed you really talk of so much about how different this book is, and I'm gonna read it because it's so fun to read to get this um, you know, to get this uh insight from you. You said um You'd think that 21 books down the line, you'd have a handle on how you write and how things happen and what it takes to get a book onto the page. But like children, every book is different and everything that you learned writing the books that came before it counts for nothing when you're confronted with a new universal to, universe to corral. And thus it was this was with this one. I didn't know I could write this fast yeah. that I wasn't doing the things I normally do, like creating a dual timeline or dime frame or flashbacks where are my teenage points of view I kept thinking where's my male character so tell us about that because that sounds I mean it is true that we think oh you know we've done this we know how this works yeah and I, I don't think of myself as a formulaic writer but the, the, it made me realize that there are certain things that I do every single time um and that is to have a teenage point of view that is to have a male point of view that is to have a some amazing house that is to have a, a split timeline that is to have maybe some form of flashback or something and I wasn't doing any of those things and I, I in fact if you're very observant you'll notice that um there's a couple of chapters in the middle of the book that are told from the point of view of Josie's daughter um because and that was a panic thing that was a, like what if my readers don't like this book because it's only got these two middle-aged women in it maybe that's not maybe but people read my books because they want more than two middle-aged women um and yeah but I don't think that even sort of no I don't think anyone would even notice that so I did feel a little bit out of control I did feel a little bit because usually and I think it's because I wrote it so fast as well because I usually start off so slowly and part of what happens while I'm writing those first you know the first third of the book incredibly slowly is the sort of unexpected things happen and it, that usually means that a, a third or a fourth character will come along um and but I was writing this so quickly and the energy between Josie and Alex was so intense yeah there just really wasn't room for anybody else in the story there was no need in fact for anybody right. else right so the only thing that I felt that I needed to do to it to really I don't know make it a more propulsive read for the reader was um it's broken up with these little clips from a a, a um, fictional Netflix documentary series that's made about the events of Alex and Josie's podcast two years after the event right um so they're not quite flash well they're all flash forwards they're just tiny little scenes mm -hmm. um 
it seemed I think that gave it enough to stop it just being two middle-aged women <laughs> well and of course I'm a middle-aged woman so I can't complain oh, yeah. about that but I did um I do feel like it gives it also that little bit of like it's, there's information in there that you don't know yet so then you wonder like wait how does that happen what what is that about and and that is you're right it does create momentum so as you wrote I mean, I love it. So tell us how long, you know, give us a sense for how long it takes. I know what you're saying. If As you're not a plotter, those those early chapters really set up everything. And so if you don't yes. know the characters and you get too far, you're kind of screwed. So I, I yes. totally appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so tell us about the, the begin, like, you know, that first third. How is that work? How do you sort of, you know, are you, are you gut instincting like this feels right? You know, are you saying I need this many words today? Are you saying I'm going to sit here until something, you know, how does that, how do you sort of set yourself up? Yes, I think it is. It's a combination of, of both of those things. When I'm actually sitting at my laptop typing the words, I'm so very much in the mode of needing to create words. That's what I'm doing. I really am doing it. And I don't know if you're the same. I don't know how much time you spend looking at your word count going up or highlighting the, the the amount of work you've done that day and checking whether you've hit a certain number of words or not rather than going on feelings I don't go on feelings I want I want the maths to tell me how many words I've done and that's kind of where I'm at when I'm writing typing let's call it typing um, <laughs> and then the other stuff happens when I'm not typing the sort mm -hmm. of the, the other stuff happens when I'm walking the dog or I'm in the shower and I can sort of see it in a more three-dimensional way it doesn't feel very three-dimensional while I'm writing does that does no, that it do makes relate to that total sense uh, it doesn't feel not, very three-dimensional especially not in the beginning right yeah. I feel like it gains dimension but in the beginning yes. you do feel like you're just scrambling around and trying to it's sort quite of thin isn't it <laughs> yeah it's it is so do you say to yourself okay I'm gonna I have to get at least a thousand words at least two thousand words what is your yeah well with this book I I gave myself the challenge of, of because normally and I'm sure you're the same when you know you've got a year to write a book mm -hmm. you feel you're quite kind to yourself in the opening weeks and months of that process right. Right. Um, and then you become less kind to yourself as your deadline gets closer and closer and closer. Um, but because for various reasons, I knew I only had six months to write this book. I didn't have that period of kindness to myself. Um, so with this one, I did set myself a 2000 word a day. From the get go, which is quite it's quite that's quite difficult it's to hit lot. the ground running to that extent. So. Putting this book to one side because it's an anomaly. Um, usually, yeah, I, I if I've written two hundred words, I'm not going to beat myself up in those first three months. Um, right. If I've written a thousand words, I'm going to go to bed delighted with myself. Right. And then, the further down the line you get, the the harder you get on yourself, and the more you right. expect. Right. I I told now. I have a question. Then, do you think that the sort of shortened time frame led to the fast? I mean, is that definitely? Do you think made this book different yes I absolutely think because it just as I said it didn't give me time to sort of wait for another character to wander in I'm so glad another character didn't wander in mm -hmm. I'm so glad I didn't you know feel that it needed something else and that was the time pressure and the energy the fact that I mean I was so amazed to find myself writing 2,000 words a day right from the beginning I didn't think that was physically possible um and so I just sort of went with it even though I didn't know what the hell it was or where it was going I just thought I'm that back to the mechanics of you know of typing and and seeing the words growing on the screen um so yes I do think knowing I only had six months made this book this book and it would have been a very different book if I'd had a year to write it isn't that interesting and I'm quite glad I didn't actually right so are you, <laughs> are you thinking now well from now on I only have six months to write a book I what well you know what because the, the book I've already finished writing another book since this one I've got to do one more rewrite on it and then I'm going to sit down and write my next novel um and the book I've written in between is out of genre it's not in my usual genre um and I'm thinking I'd like to do something usually I really like to mix things up but I think I'd like to do something quite similar with the next one a similar kind of Netflix documentary not with the structure but with the feeling mm -hmm. um and maybe I should do that maybe I should give myself six months see if I can recreate the 
it doesn't work like that does it no I mean I, li I like the idea I like the I like yeah. the idea of it of course but so when you're but when you're writing you know I, I have to imagine that some of those you know days are false starts right you read the day before and think this is not at all where this should be going this doesn't work and then do you so I you know I, and I'm, a, I'm an absolute spreadsheet maths person I want to know you know, I, I, I really like to know my, you know, the number of words and I'm always like, well, I lost this many words, but I wrote this many words. Yes. So now I only net, you know, I only netted 800, even though I actually yeah. wrote, you know, 1400 and I had to scrap those other ones. So I imagine. Oh, I absolutely am the same. Yes. <laughs> yeah. As you're working, um, is it a matter of sort of like, you know, reading the day before and thinking, uh, you know, along when you're starting out, is this where we're going? Is this working? Or do you get to a certain point and sort of go back and look at like 10,000 words and think, is this working? Are you doing that all? Yeah, around? every now and then if I hit a, a, a small, I never hit huge brick walls, but if I, if I hit a small brick wall, I think, okay, let's go way back now. Like you say, probably about 10,000 words back. And let's really look at this in a, in a, a less sort of granular way. And let's look at much more of the big picture of what the hell it is I've been doing here for the last few weeks. Right. <laughs> And that can be really, really helpful. And another thing I found really helpful is, do you have anybody who reads while you're writing? Well, I was going I do have somebody. That's new for me. I yeah, done it's that new for me as well. And it's helpful, right? It's really helpful. I tell you why. Obviously, it's really helpful to have someone feeding back to you while you're writing. Someone, it has to be the right person. It can't just be anyone. And yeah. I have found the right person. But the the other really good thing about it is, it forces you to tidy up your manuscript. And As it forces you, you to, yeah, it forces you to look at it and it, and and, and make, make it readable. And in that process of making it readable for your early reader, you can often see things in a much more sort of objective way and yes. and fix fix things that you might not have thought to fix if you were just stuck on your own um, in your in your own little world with it. So, I yeah, this, I've, I've had two books in now and it's good. Yeah. I love it. Me too. I'm just work. I'm just writing the second book where I'm working with somebody, sort of like sending chunks, checking in, sending chunks, yes. and it makes a huge difference. You know, this is such a lonely business that we don't really think about, like a you know, a, a, having a sort of a partner in it. And yet, when you do, that person bounce and even just bouncing the idea, like this is what I think happens next, and they ask one question, and you're like, oh, I hadn't thought about that, right? Because there's so much you're just not thinking about. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. No, no, it's, it's, it's a really nice thing. And, and it is very important, as I say, has to be the right person because mm. the wrong person can just hinder the process horribly. So if you're lucky yeah. enough to find someone who absolutely brings the thing to life for you, then definitely yes. a good shares your vision of the story and helps you sort of get it to where you want it to be. So since we're, this is killer women, I wanted to talk, one of the things I thought was fabulous about this book and I, you know, and I, I mean, among a, a million things, but was the, uh, these two women, right. Both of whom, you know, the, these are middle-aged women, you know, we're coming from a position of, you know, being that age approximately. I'm a, of course a little older than these ladies, but the idea being that, that it's in both women's, in both women's lives, they're somewhat stuck, right? They're a little bit stuck because of, you know, their marriages, their children, and a little disillusioned, obviously, you know, at, to different levels. But Alex, yeah. I think it, what makes her interesting is that she does sort of have this, you know, all glittery, kind of from the outside, perfect looking life. And yet she's not fully satisfied, right? She is looking for yeah. something else. Yes. And so so there's two interesting things about that. The interesting thing, um, the first interesting thing is that once Josie becomes party to Alex's life um, and is, in fact, inside Alex's home, which is not a spoiler, um, mm -hmm. because Alex's recording studio is in her home, um, you're constantly seeing the disappointment from Josie's point of view, who'd spent like two weeks looking at Alex's Instagram feed and imagining just truly believing as I do think a lot of people do truly believe that some people's lives can be perfect some people actually believe that that other yeah. people's lives can be perfect and she does and then she sees that Alex's life is so far from perfect just things like she's seen Alex's amazing kitchen on Instagram and then she's standing in Alex's kitchen and she sees that there's like crap all over the floor that Alex hasn't hasn't swept the kitchen floor and there's been the same piece of litter on the floor for like a whole week and nobody's picked it up 
to the fact that Alex's marriage, which to anybody looking out, looking in from the outside would look glorious, is putrid. I mean, Alex's right. husband is a binge drinker um, and he goes out on vendors. And while he's, you know, he's a good man and a good husband and a good father most of the time, every couple of weeks, he'll go to the pub for a pint and and Alex won't see him for 48 hours. He'll just disappear. Right. Right. Um, and Josie is furious. She's yes. so, so cross that Alex's life isn't perfect and that she's allowed these imperfections in her world because... Yes, yes. It's so in her judgment of Alex. Yes, so... she's so judgy, isn't she? Yes. yes. And that's very powerful because, of course, you know, she has managed to make her own life into a fantasy in her in her mind. Yes. And, and so it's Alex's life. And, and she makes she's puts quite a bit of pressure on Alex that Alex does not miss. Right. Yeah. And that sort of in that I find is really, really interesting too. And then the idea of this, you know, we know what it's like when you've got a house full of children and a, you know, and it's not, there is litter on the floor for yeah. a week at a time. So it's, um, but she really yeah. gets no, under Alex's skin. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. And then, yeah, there's the thing that so, so Josie's older daughter, Erin, uh, who's 23, is a gaming addict, or, or yes. just let's just call her a gamer. Yeah. Um, and then she, you know, she she feels bad about that that she's allowed to, her daughter to become a reclusive gamer. But then in Alex's house, she sees the little boy. You know, he's nine years old, and he's on the he's on the sofa with his headphones on. Right. You right. know, completely glued to the screen in front of him, and she's like, "You're not so different to me." Right. Um, and, yes, yeah. she does. She, right, she she doesn't. She sort of gets a little bit uh, superior. She has in her yeah. brain. She's sort of like, absolutely. Oh, look, you're this. Yeah, you're the same. I, I, yeah. yeah, I really appreciate that because I think, and it, and it, of course, when people do that to us, and people do, of course, do that to us, they shine back on us, sort of the lesser attractive aspects of our lives, and we take it. It's very hard to, you know, it's very hard for. And Alex, it, it really impacts her, right? I mean, she's very. Yes. She's, you know, very empathetic and very, and she gets sort of caught in, in Josie's, you know, in Josie's sort of spiraling and to the point yes. where it really impacts sort of her ability to stand her ground and all sorts of things and leads to one, you know, with the wonderful drama that is. Yes, yeah. absolutely. And I know that sometimes in this genre, it's frustrating when people make decisions that maybe the reader wouldn't make in the moment and let people in that the reader would think, well, I wouldn't let that happen. I wouldn't let that person in. I would I would draw a line right here. Um, but number one, the genre wouldn't exist if everybody right. drew those and made the, the decisions. But number two, sometimes it's really hard to draw the line. Sometimes yeah. when you're confronted with a person right. who, who has exerts such a powerful energy around themselves, you're yeah, maybe number one, scared of offending them and not sure what offending them might lead to. Right. Or or you feel sorry for them, or you think I might, I'm going to make this bad decision in this moment, but I can fix it in the next moment. Right. Um, and sometimes it's not that easy just to say, hold on, this isn't a good idea. Let's stop right, right here. Life right. isn't like that. Life has no. its own momentum sometimes. Absolutely. And I, I, you know, I think the big thing about these characters making what, you know, people might look at as bad decisions is all about the motivation of doing it. And so I think, you know, and you do that really well. Alex makes, yeah, she makes some bad decisions around, you know, Josie, but she makes them really because I think she does have this empathy and she is in this place in her life where she's also a little bit, you know, trying to figure out what's next and her relationship with her husband's a little off. And so to me, it doesn't feel like, I, I think it's unfair for people to be like, oh, well, no one would ever do that because yeah. that is absolutely not true. <laughs> yeah, it people, is absolutely not true. It is absolutely not people true. People <laughs> make decisions for all sorts of reasons. And like you said, sometimes you know, in hindsight, we're like, well, that was a bad decision, but that's hindsight and it's yeah. 2020, right? And in the yeah. moment, not so much. Um, there's also this wonderful, um, I love this because this totally reminds me of marriage in general. And this is, I'm taking a quote from page um, 116, which is about, um, it's about when um, Alexon is out with her husband, right? And she says, um, because of course, Nathan drinks too much, right? Um, and it's, um, let's see, she knows already that this will be one of those nights that she doesn't want to be that wife, the purse slipped, stuck up the butt wife, the wife who can't relax and can't have fun and spoils it for everyone else. 
She wants to down tequila shots and sing and dance and laugh like a drain, but she can't take on that role because Nathan has already staked his claim on it. And one of them has to remain sentient and together. One of them has to be the grown up. And I find that to be so true too about relationships, right? Is especially when there's young kids involved, you're like, yes, that looks like fun, but we can't both do that. And so one person ends up being, you know, the, the fun person and the other person ends yes. up being sort of the, you know, stick up the butt person, which yes. I thought was. Yeah, no, and it's so true. And then in this case, it is, is Alex. Alex has to be the grown up because, yeah. yeah. Because Nathan, Nathan has made it, Nathan's made it very clear that he's, yeah. Yeah, not up to the job uh-uh. now when <laughs> he can play with the involved. he can play with the kids right make them laugh and, and do that you know be fun dad but when it comes to yeah the responsibility the side right <laughs> so uh, one more thing you say in your acknowledgments that i also love is that you do sort of tend to pick up people from the world that you sort of watch people and you know um and you know like you said strangers in windows and on the beaches and on the street um, who spark ideas and and birth worlds, and so you mentioned that you, they, they'll you know that they're these people that you pick up who will never know that they just ended up uh, in a in being in a novel. It's so weird, isn't it? It's so yeah. weird. I I think particularly with o, with Owen Pick from Invisible Girl, I always think about him. I always, I don't know. I just, I mean, I really did write a whole novel about him. Yeah. Um, yeah and and he will never know and even if and he do you, read the were, novel, do you remember yeah do you remember when you first I mean can you picture the the man that this started Owen Pick yeah he was just so bland looking he wasn't as old as Walter he was probably only in his 50s and yeah he was just salt and pepper hair bland face ordinary staring at his computer minding his own business not thinking there was some mad novelist walking past his window <laughs> i love it i love He's making it. up is... weird fantasies about him <laughs> that is yeah well that is fabulous well it, it's true so you better watch out if you see lisa joel on the street and she's watching yeah. you you know act normal act no <laughs> right act not yeah act not uh bland or or yeah <laughs> Do something wild and crazy. Although I think you could probably end up in a book that way too. So yeah. you never know. You may just end up in a Lisa Jewell book. So speaking of Lisa Jewell books, it sounds like you've got already something coming in the works. Can you, you said it's non-genre. Can you tell us anything about it? I know sometimes you I, can't. I'm not allowed to talk very much about it. I'm thinking at this point, because it's nearly finished, that I'm allowed to at least say what genre it's in. Okay. Um, it is. It is, widely speaking, it's sci-fi. But the closer, because I'm rewriting it and rewriting it at the moment, and actually every time I rewrite it, it becomes more like a Black Mirror thing and less okay. sci-fi. Okay. So it's got a bit, it's got a real Black Mirror vibey thing going on right now. Um, but I can't talk about it because it's a different publisher and it's a big project that they're launching and it hasn't been launched yet. So got it. Well, that is really exciting. <laughs> and so, can you tell us just a little bit, like you know, what made you want to do something so different? Uh, what made me want to do something so different was my agent phoning me up one afternoon saying, you won't believe the email that I've just, that's just dropped in my inbox. And then he read it out to me. Um, and it was uh, an extraordinary, what can we call it? Should we call it a brand name? Okay. And an extraordinary offer financially as well. And the two things were just I would kick myself forever if I said no to this, even if it is going to be a massive challenge and, and a huge sort of jump out of my comfort zone. And and also that was part of it as well, jumping out of my comfort zone. I'm a big mm-hmm. fan of my comfort zone in every <laughs> aspect of life. I love my comfort zone. And I so very rarely leave it. Um, so this seemed like a, you know, I'd rather do this than cold swimming. Let's put it that way. So. Oh God, right? I know Claire McIntosh <laughs> and her cold swimming. I'm always, <laughs> I'm always like, you're a crazy lady. Well, that's yeah. fun. So that's why the, the, this book had to be written more quickly because you were fitting in this other thing. Well, fitting gosh, in another you, book. Yes. Look at you yeah. go. So you're going to have two books out potentially next year. Well, I'm not because of various other tedious shenanigans that aren't worth going into here. But so you know, basically, I've just shifted everything along now which is good for my American publishers because it gives them nice big lead up to my publishing um, yes. schedule now. They used, to, they used to have a really tight um, lead up time yeah. and now they've got generous lead up time. So it's good. 
Good. Well, it's good. Well, I have to say, Lisa, what a, it was so much fun to talk to you. And I, it's always nice to hear from people who don't plot. Cause I think these yeah. people who plot are probably, I they I feel like they're much smarter than I am. Cause I think it sounds like a better idea to know where you're going. I don't know about you, but at the end of a novel, I end up with an out file that is like 40,000 words. And I think, God, that's half of, you know, it's a half another book that I had to throw away. Exactly. Um, Exactly. But, you know, but then you didn't spend two months beforehand researching and making notes and writing chapter outlines. And I've heard of people who've written, literally have written outlines of a novel that were 30,000 words long. Right. So, you know, we're just making work for ourselves in other ways, doing it. Off, doing it <laughs> exactly. Off exactly. So this is out on August 8th. And actually, our and podcast, it looks like this. And it looks like that. It's beautiful. I know I might have to get myself a hard copy of the beautiful version. And um and it, this is the podcast is going is airing today is your pub day as we air on uh on the killer women podcast page so congratulations on pub day thank and you for those of you who have not are not an automatic lisa jewel buyer reader which is i can't imagine there's more than a handful you must must try this and then once you discover lisa you have a lot of books to to dig in and delve in because she is so talented and the books are so fun and I just love this one Lisa so thank you so oh, much for joining me thank you for having me it's been wonderful so everybody this was uh Danielle Gerard on Killer Women podcast with Lisa Joel and her new book None of This Is True we will see you next time bye